the whole point is to try and make options more accessible, more approachable and more intuitive. Why are you doing these trades? What are you trying to achieve? Like, that's what I've always done from when I first started Options Insight. Make people realise that they're, they're not as risky as they're made out to be. In fact, they kind of help you manage your risk if you understand how to use them correctly. I'm going to try and lay it out in those layman's terms and, and make it much more understandable than I think the, the average option course out there does. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. Today, we're going to ask the question whether the options market has called off the recession already. It is today the 15th of February, Wednesday, and I'm joined by uh, not only a friend of mine, but also a great contributor to this platform, Imran Laka, the founder of Options Insight. Great to see you, Imran. Hey, Andres. Good to see you. How are you doing? Good. I mean, um, what a crazy end to the day. Just before we went on air, we discussed the price action in Bitcoin uh, late uh, during this session. Uh, I mean, how would you describe today's price action, Iran? Explosive, which uh, Bitcoin loves to be. You know, it, it can it can go for a little nap for about three or four days, and then when it wakes up, it it, it, it makes you take notice. Mm, it does. So, Imran, I, I'd like to start uh, today's session with a discussions on probabilities of outcomes um, relative to what the option market is pricing currently. It seems to me as if we have sort of three camps right now. One camp being the recessionistas, the second camp being the soft landing camp, and then the third camp being the higher for longer due to a booming economy camp. So how do you assess these three scenarios and what do options markets tell you about how these scenarios are priced currently? Now, you know, pricing recession scenarios and things like that are difficult using option markets just because, you know, you might have a recession, but that doesn't necessarily mean the S&P is going to be at a certain level or something like that. Right. I mean, we had we had a recession in 2020 and we saw after the initial knee jerk, we saw what the equity market can do, even if, if we're in a recessionary sort of economic environment. So um, you kind of need to take it a little bit with a grain of salt. But what you can do is you can look at how the probabilities are changing. Right. So, for example, um, rates markets are probably the better place to anchor on. Um, and, and, you know, a good options market to kind of help gauge some probabilities there would be, say, something like the SOFA uh, options which are, you know, the euro dollar futures are moving over to the sofa futures. Um, and you can price in uh, the idea of where rates might be, say, in June next year um, to get a gauge for how much cuts maybe would be needed in a recessionary outcome. If you thought rates in a recession could go back down to 2%, for example, if that was kind of your anchor that you're leaning on, you could price in very tight call spreads in sofa futures out to June 24 that tell you what the implied probability is of going up there by June to 2% rates. Um, and whereas, you know, a week ago, those were pro implied probability of about 12%. They've reduced this week as terminal rates have pushed higher and the entire SOFA curve has moved by about 20 basis points. So those implied probabilities for rates to go to 2%, if that is what you're leaning on as your recession outcome, has gone down to about 8% now. Mm. Interesting price points and um, something that kind of resembles my gut feeling right now that the recession risk is being priced out almost by the minute. Earlier this week, I noticed how you talked about uh, how option market dynamics sort of kept S&P 500 from falling below 4100, um, the big handle level there. Um, so please elaborate on the dynamics underlying that view and why you think equities held up decently well, despite a, a pretty firm CPI report. Yeah, so you had a lot of um, hedging coming in at the end of last week. The back end of last week, there was a large chunks of notional being bought, whether it was on VIX calls, whether it was on um, February end of this week, so this Friday expiry put options, uh, and they were struck in the kind of 40, 50 S&P and, and slightly lower that kind of strike range. And that brought a really big bid to implied volatility. So February options were up like four vol points last week. March options were pretty well bid as well. And that often happens going into something like a CPI, which is considered to be a volatility inducing event. But because so much of that hedging flow came in, it meant that dealers 
were selling puts to clients and arguably they were also buying calls from clients who were selling calls to finance some of that protection. So you know that the street is structurally in a position where it's short puts and long calls and it's selling futures on the S&P against that to delta hedge that position. Okay, And the vol is getting elevated as those positions are being put on because, you know, the market makers are charging more and more the more that they get lifted in those options out of uh, out of those options they need to charge a higher price for them so then when the event actually occurs if the event isn't so game changing and so you know badly received by the market and for the most part a lot of this was you know expected that the numbers would come in a little bit hot i'd say the whisper for the numbers was probably hotter than the actual headline consensus numbers so it wasn't a massive shock to the market we did knee jerk lower but because implied vols had, had got so pumped into the event, when those implied vols came crashing back down, like they always do on an event day, that risk premium comes back out of the surface. And what that does is that changes the, the dealer's exposure. It changes the amount of delta, the amount of futures that those de- dealers need to hold against option positions. So it basically forces those dealers to buy futures. So even though the market is dipping lower, the change in implied volatility across the whole curve is forcing dealers to need to buy futures. And that is what's providing support to the market. And, and that is why we really struggle to break materially below 4,100. Uh, and we actually found ourselves rally back to unchanged by the end of the day. If, if we assess this situation live now uh, today, Imran, uh, what's your um, expectation for the S&P 500 dynamics going forward after we've sort of settled um, on levels above this um, handle 4100 after the CPI report? Uh, what's your expectations for the coming weeks? Yeah, so, so I think there's probably still a little bit of bleed that needs to come off from this protection that's been bought. It's not worth a lot anymore. But the, the passage of time between now and Friday probably still burns some of this premium off and therefore dealers still have some delta exposure to cover. So that may well still be supportive for the market and prevent the market from really going down between now and Friday. Um, then, you know, if the rates, because normally you would have thought, given what the rates market's done, why are equities not a good 100 points lower, right? I think market could, we could easily justify seeing the S&P 100 points lower than it is in the face of what the rates market has done. The fact that that hasn't happened because of potentially this option dynamic that's in place, once that expiry rolls off on Friday, and if, let's say, we get a bit more of a push in the rates market over the weekend, then equities might need to have a bit of a catch-up move and may then move to the downside. Now, I don't think that's the start of necessarily something massively sinister in the equity market. I think that would maybe just be a bit of a catch-up to where where the macro markets are and now that those options positions have been cleared out and are no longer supporting the market uh but then then going forward over the next one to two months i think it's going to be back to you know what's going on with the china reopening what's happening to net liquidity these type of factors that are really ultimately going to drive risk assets and if if bitcoin is anything to go by <laughs> as, a, as a net liquidity gauge we're off to the races again right for now yeah wow what a price action in bitcoin this yeah. uh, this late afternoon imran um this week we received the latest um report from bank of america uh, where they survey fund managers each and every month on their positioning across assets uh, and i was kind of surprised to see the numbers for february since it looks very bearish though this sentiment survey um equities are clearly underweight relative to benchmarks in this survey and bonds are clearly overweighted relative to benchmarks in this survey and it was kind of the same result as in mid-january despite this rally that we've seen in in risk assets how uh, do you do you find this survey sort of rhyming with um what you see in skews and option space in both equities and, and bonds that's interesting that you're saying that. I mean, I haven't read the survey, mm. um, but basically, I would say the January rally definitely sucked some positioning back in, right? Um, we we definitely saw, you know, the tech space that was very unloved and very underweight that squeezed really hard, right? We saw um, the Dow Jones, for example, had outperformed massively since the October lows um, compared to the Nasdaq, for example. And then as we went through earnings season and we saw those mega cap tech names do reasonably well out of earnings. NASDAQ had a big catch up. So I think the underweight in tech started to get addressed, um, probably hasn't been fully addressed. But, you know, the, the, the thing that I found interesting was that 
last year we saw skew very compressed in the options market, right? Mm. And that was because everyone was massively underweight. So there was literally no need to buy protection when you just don't own any of, mar- of the market exposure. If anything, you need to buy call options to head your underweight. That has kind of flipped on its head a bit in the last few weeks. And we've definitely seen put buying come in, you know, case in point, what we saw into the CPI. But in general, that, that put buying really only comes back when people have got some exposure to hedge. So the, the bid that we've seen come back to skew suggests to me that people have got a bit longer equities. That's not to say that there's not more room that they can get even longer. Um, but, but, you know, counteractive to what you might think, oh, you know, skew going bid means everyone's bearish. It's not really how it works a lot of the time in options markets. Skew going bid only happens when people are long the market and then they need to hedge that tail and they can afford to sell upside as well, right? Skew going bid is a function of both Put, be, put downside being bid and upside being offered. Mm. That upside is more likely to be offered if you own the market and you're comfortable selling calls against it. Mm. So you could actually view this as sort of a confirmation that the market has gotten longer yeah. over the past couple of, uh, of weeks here. It makes sense, um, Imran. So the bottom line here, how do we play equities in this environment? I mean, it seems like cyclical stocks seemingly like this uh, current scenario of slightly lower inflation paired with just a tiny bit of optimism surrounding the growth scenario. So what's your take going forward here on uh, on equity sectors and uh, the overall market? Yeah, no, uh, good. it's a good question. I don't think it's an easy one. Um, mm. I, I think the ARC basket has probably rallied a little bit too much mm. now. Um, but who's to say it can't keep squeezing, right? I mean, it's one of those things. It's hard to call a top on this thing given how much squeeze potential it's got. But Tesla going from 100 back to 210 in a month, pretty punchy. Um, so, you know, I, I don't mind uh, the idea of fading the arc rally. Um, you obviously do it in, in, the, in size that you're comfortable in. But, you know, with the vol relatively elevated in, in the 50s uh, in arc, you know, you could do something like a put spread versus a call. You could buy a put spread on arc. Um, some, the arc's trading at about 43 right now. Let's say you bought the 4035 put spread, which is five dollars wide. You can probably sell the 50 call against that to get it close to zero cost. Uh, if you did it in something like April expiry, if you wanted to fade the arc rally, so that'd be that'd be a trade that that I'd potentially think about doing. Um, in sectors generally, yeah, I, I don't mind like the the commodity sectors like XLE, XME. I, I do think they've got potential this year. They they did come out of the gates a little bit quick. Um, so they needed to correct on, on the China narrative getting a bit overblown. Um, I do still believe that that narrative comes back uh, and has some legs to it. Um, so buying dips or something in, in those commodity sectors, uh, I think is probably a sensible trade. Uh, but the entry point is probably not here right now. Fair enough, uh, Imran. Recently, we've seen quite a pronounced repricing of the front end of uh, dollar interest rates after the CPI report, but also after a uh, couple of comments from the uh, Federal Open Market Committee, kind of suggesting that they will remain higher for longer uh, in their policy setup. You've been pondering whether TLT call spreads could make sense in the current environment. So a TLT call spread is obviously a bet on lower long-term interest rates in, in the US. What makes you optimistic that the far end of the dollar yield curve could actually compress a bit from here? It's just the just the way the curve just keeps inverting more and more. Mm. Basically, right? every, every time we get any inflationary data or any hawkish rhetoric, yeah, the front goes, but the back just can't keep pace with it. Basically, mm. right? So it just seems to me that you know even the higher for longer is just pricing cuts out of 2023. But the curve's saying when the cuts come, they're coming hard and they're coming fast, right? And and then there's not letting that curve re-steepen. So, you know, I, I had been running a bit of a, a flattener position and, and against what everyone was telling me, to, everyone was saying, you're mad running a flattener at like minus 50 because, <laughs> you know, negative carry and it's just, you know, it's already very extreme. But I, it just felt like the pain trade was for it to keep going. I, I actually took it off today before it went even further. I was like, we're getting so close to minus 100 now. I'd be stunned if we didn't have some kind of reversal soon. Um, but that flattener has been working. And, and that just says to me that there's an underlying bid and demand for the long end of the curve. So that when we do finally start to look past this no landing, soft landing narrative and come back to the idea that growth data may start really accelerating lower, then I, I think bonds come screaming back. 
Uh, and I think the risk reward you can get on some of these call spreads in TLT out to June, we're looking at four to one, five to one type payouts, a really nice way to park that position in your book, knowing that exactly how much you can lose. That's what options allow you to do, right? Put your premium down, know that it's not going anywhere till June and you can make five times your money kind of thing. So that, that would be, that's what I'm looking at. So what's the uh, kind of market pricing of TLT if we look, say, one, two, three quarters ahead? How do you uh, assess the skew in uh, the far end of the yield curve relative to your views on the uh, U.S. economy? Yeah, it's, it's not really. I mean, the skew is in generally in bonds is quite flat. right? Mm. So it's not as flat as it has been. Yeah, it was almost zero. And when I say skew, generally you're looking at one month, 25 delta risk reversals, where you compare the 25 delta put versus the vol on the 25 delta call. And if that vol is, if that vol differential is zero, it means the skew is flat. The skew is slightly for puts, which means those upside calls are trading at a slightly lower vol than the puts are. But when you're doing a call spread, we're talking about TLT here at about 103, 104. You're doing the 110, 120 call spread. Then, then the volatility of the 110 call that you're buying versus the volatility of the 120 that you're selling is, is actually quite flat. If anything, you might be getting a little bit of premium out of that 120 because it's riding up the wings and the wings of the vol surface tend to slope higher, basically, right? So you're not having to take any hit in that the option that you're selling, you're selling at a lower implied vol or anything like that. So when you've got assets that trade with quite a flat skew, then it makes trading spreads like that look relatively attractive. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, Imran. The question, recession or not, is obviously still on uh, everyone's lips. Uh, but the question also relates to this trade in, in bond space, obviously, since one should expect TLT to perform if this recession actually uh, arrives. So is the option market overall a good marketplace to find opportunities against such a binary macro backdrop recession or not? I mean... Yeah, the, the options in general just give you quite a lot of flexibility. Um, you know, the, the, they they really help you control your risk and your exposure. But, you know, the problem is so many users of options these days are just focus on the really speculative, high octane, short dated stuff. Right? I mean, literally 50% of the options volume right now is zero DTE, SPY, Qs and S&P options. Right. Mm. And those things are the most binary outcomes you're ever going to get. You're either going to lose all your money or it's going to multiply spectacularly, right? And it's going to do it within a matter of hours, right? That's never really how I'm looking to play options, right? I don't think I've ever traded a zero DTE in my life, pretty much. Um, I've got to have a very, very strong reason for doing it, right? And a very strong conviction. So generally, you know, if you're using options a bit more sensibly, like like the institutions do, you're 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 parking your premium further out, right? Mm. Maybe six weeks is kind of the shortest you really want to do when you're doing long premium positions to keep that time decay down and keep that bleed down. And then you're structuring your positions to give yourself leverage to any capital that you put down, right? So if you're a buyer of options, you want to make sure you're in options or you're in, in, in structures like spreads that can multiply in value. So you're actually getting some positive leverage to the premium that you're exposing at risk. And by parking those things in longer maturities, like six weeks to even three months or whatever, the time decay of that thing isn't going to be so heavy that within the next two weeks, the positions just disappeared and evaporated and lost all of its money, right? So that's generally how I like to do it from a long premium perspective. Um, and then as those structures become short dated, maybe they become two, three weeks to maturity. If the move that you're looking for hasn't started to materialize, then you need to think about rolling the position if you still believe in it or, or just cutting it because it hasn't worked out and you want to get some premium back and things like that. And if you approach it from that perspective, then you're not just going to be taking punts. It's not going to be like a gambling thing and, and just like a casino, like a lot of people seem to be using the options market for. <laughs> you, you, you can have quite smooth PL profiles, but that still are very good from a risk adjusted PL point of view because you understand the behavior of the premium and you understand that you have very fixed losses that you can take whilst you have quite open ended upside. Mm. One of the missing links for this recession to actually arrive is a rising unemployment rate. And I wanted to play a soundbite for you from a discussion between Roger Hurst and Damian Horner on uh, The Knitting Show on Real Vision, where they discuss 
how to assess unemployment in the context of these recessionary risks. So let's listen to Roger and Damien and get back to that discussion. In fact, you could actually say there will be no recession unless we see unemployment pick up. So unemployment is one of the indicators that we look for. The rising unemployment means we're going to have a recession. Yeah, and, and the NBER, which are the people who decide what is or isn't a recession in the US, and it's not two consecutive quarters of negative GDP, no. they go for things like, and, and I'm plagiarising here, but duration, so it's got to be quite a long period of, of this slowdown. It's got to have depth, so the slowdown has to be quite deep. You know, yep. it can't be just minus 0.1% GDP sure. growth. And it's got to have dispersion, which means it kind of hits into all parts of the economy. Right. Yeah. And, and that dispersion is normally the thing you see through higher unemployment. And as we currently stand, that unemployment level is extremely low. So we've got this very strange labour market, which currently looks tight, but it might not be strong, even though unemployment is low. But we really need to see that pick up. And, and you know, people will say, oh, but we can have a recession, you know, when you've got the ISM at 47. It's like, yeah, we've seen ISM at 47, but when unemployment's been low, we've not been in a recession. We've only ever seen recessions with an ISM at 47 or below when unemployment's been going up. The Knitting Show is already available for Plus subscribers to Real Vision uh, today at the platform. Back to you, Imran. Unemployment, the missing link. Do you see any whatsoever hints out there right now that unemployment will start rising soon? Yeah, I mean, it has been a bit of a surprise, the way these numbers are holding up. Um, you know, there's been a lot said about seasonal adjustments and like the big difference between the household survey and the non-farm numbers. There being like a gaping hole of like, was it two million jobs or something? Mm. I, it's very hard to know what numbers to kind of really trust. But the initial jobless claim numbers haven't been going up either, right, and, in any material way. And and, and the point that, that I read that I found was interesting was that obviously a lot of these layoffs are tech layoffs. And if you've got a 300 grand severance package, you're not in a rush to go and put yourself down for, for jobless claims, right? Mm. So, so really it needs to be the, 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 the people at the, the lower end of the spectrum in terms of earnings for the layoffs to really show up in a big way, right? Mm. And we don't, it, that doesn't seem to have happened yet. So that, that seems to be the lag that the layoffs are coming more in the tech space. Um, and when they finally do, if and when they finally filter through to the rest of the economy, that's when it's really going to hit numbers. And, and then it might be actually quite sudden and quite fast. Mm. Hard, hard for me to know when that's going to happen, but that's kind of how I'm rationalizing at the moment. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that uh, assessment for now, Imran. One of the things that... I find interesting in the commodity space in relation to this recession discussion is whether gold is a good addition to the portfolio or not. And gold has gold has clearly shown some signs of fatigue price wise over the past couple of weeks uh, in conjunction with this repricing of interest rates in the US uh, after the uh, stronger uh, CPI report. But what do you make of the price action in gold? And do you have an, uh, sort of a, an idea of, of how to play it from here? Yeah, I mean, we've been calling gold the correct. We got in there a bit early, right? I think it was on the 10th of Jan that I said, look, every man and their dog is bullish gold, so I think it's going lower. <laughs> so mm. so I bought some puts on gold back then, a little bit early, but they, they've started to come good now. And we rolled them from February to March because, you know, but, but the point is, I think if we can pull back to around that 1800 area, then I think gold allocation starts to make sense again, basically. So I, I do think you know that there is some validity to the dollar um topping story over the course of the year um it might have a little push higher than where it is now still to go which will take metals down uh copper was also looking a bit overextended and needed to pull back copper's kind of in this battleground at around four dollars right now and it trying to hold that that key support level but i think the, the level for gold is going to be 1800 we're not a million miles we're about one to two percent away from there I expect that level to probably work as a bit of support and then to get into either structural long positions in, in a long long only or a long term portfolio makes sense just from a delta one perspective. But even on the option side, volatility is not overly expensive. It's on a 13 handle on gold now and the curve's quite flat. So you can go even six months out in call options. They're not very expensive. Um, maybe you want to do call spreads if you want to keep your theta down even more. 
um, longer dated call spreads, just similar to the TLT trade in gold, I think will start to make sense. But I think the entry point comes maybe one to two percent lower. Mm. This gold trade is uh, obviously linked to the FX market as well. If we get this weakness in the US dollar, uh, it is typically a, a sign to buy commodities and, and gold, broadly speaking. So what's your take on um, the development in the euro versus the dollar uh, in the context of this discussion? And what are option markets telling you around the um, sort of speculative action in the, in euro dollar? So vols have come down quite a bit in FX since last year. Um, so, you know, FX was pretty, pretty wild last year. It has calmed down. Uh, DXY, you know, kind of ground lower to about 101, 102, bounced up here to 104 and, and is just stuck there for now. It hasn't done a lot. Um, implied vol on euros down to an eight handle. Um, you know, it can go as low as six, but, but eight, is, eight doesn't feel very expensive. Um, in terms of skew, there, there used to be a lot of skew on the downside, particularly in sterling. Also in euro, that's all kind of normalized. Uh, I think the euro strength that took the euro all the way up to, I think it stretched close to 110. Mm. That was on the back of um, economic data surprises in Europe massively outperforming the US. We have started to see those economic surprise indices roll over again. So the US is coming back on a relative basis. And we've therefore seen the euro pull back to where it is now around 107. So it's in a bit of no man's land right now. Obviously, there's been a bit more of a, Dollar, dollar optimism come back on the back of you know terminal rates pushing to new cycle highs. Maybe that dynamic can continue a bit. You know, people are talking about the June meeting for the FOMC now potentially being on the table, whereas it wasn't a few weeks ago. Um, the dollar might, like I said, the dollar might have a little bit more of a push to DXY another two three percent. But then, then I wouldn't be surprised if we're kind of now done with talking up terminal rates to wherever they are five and a half five point six percent wherever it is. And then maybe the euro can continue um, a little charge higher as the ECB uh, stays hawkish in the face of that lagging inflation. We uh, have received a, a couple of great questions from our members. And um, one of them relates to the discussion on uh, the gold price and the uh, gold development going forward. Um, it's a question from Suhaib. Uh, he's asking you, we know that the Fed won't stop until the unemployment rate goes up, but the consumer spending data shows a lot of strength currently. Doesn't this suggest that we're less likely to see employment falling off a cliff like many of us were expecting by the beginning of the year? If so, does this indicate the soft landing narrative is gaining legitimacy? And how would gold likely fit into a soft landing given the geopolitical backdrop? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, gold in, in terms of a soft landing is probably not the best scenario for gold, right? Um, but, you know, we have had gold pull back pretty materially from recent highs, right? It was at 1960 and it's nearly back at 1800. So it's had a good move down. Um, I think the question will be, you know, how does it trade at 1800, right? Do, do we start to see consolidation and do we start to see that, that body of support in the market? You know, it, it, apparently China were accumulating gold like it was going out of fashion, right? Which is one of the reasons why it accelerated to the upside, right? So if they start to come in again and start accumulating, and we see the more positive price action in gold, then I then I'd be I'd be leaning on that to kind of give me the confirmation that yes, you want to be adding some length in gold, right? You don't necessarily want to catch a falling knife in any of these things, but you want to look at what levels you have in mind for it to approach, and then if the behavior does match what you're anticipating around those levels, then you, then you can start to put things on. Uh, we have a question on uh, on copper as well. Um, one of our uh, viewers um, finds copper to be a buy and dips, uh, fair enough. Uh, and he's asking you whether you find any smart ways of expressing a buy and dip strategy in, um, in the option space on copper. Yeah, I mean, generally, I don't find copper options particularly easy to trade, right, as a retail guy. Um, so I use Freeport Matmaran as a bit of a proxy for that in the option space because those options are fairly liquid and tradable. Um, so, you know, I, I used some um, Freeport Matmaran risk reversals. To, I, I do own that stock as well in my long-term portfolio. So I used some risk reversals when I thought that copper was toppy. I thought that stock was a bit toppy after its earnings came out and it ripped 4% on that day. So that was when the stock was at around 46, I think. Um, it's traded back to 42 now. It's had a 10% pullback. I haven't, I, I haven't done a lot. My, I bought back my calls on the risk reversal. I'm still long the puts. 
So I'm still hedged on my position on the stock. But at some point, I'm looking to monetize my puts just to be long the stock again, basically, because I do like Freeport and I do like the copper story. In terms of adding extra exposure to the likes of copper, um, because the vol generally trades quite expensive in this stuff, like Freeport's easily going to be, you know, in the 30s or 40s on the vol side. If you are so inclined, you can sell puts um, to buy the dip, right? Mm. So you can just basically say, how much of the stock am I willing to buy? And then you sell that notion of puts of a lower strike and you just collect the premium. And if the stock does drop below your strike, you take delivery of the stock and you get into the stock at discount and you're comfortable with that, right? So that can be a nice systematic way to kind of buy the dip uh, via selling put options systematically, right? Every, every month or something like that. Imran, always a great pleasure to host you uh, at Real Vision. I'll allow you uh, 60 seconds to watch the end of the show here to elaborate uh, on your uh, academy product on on options, on Real Vision. So what's in that academy product and uh, why should the uh, listeners uh, take a look at it? Yeah, so, so we try and give a holistic view of the options market, the players in the options market, the considerations when it comes to trading options, why people do bother trading options how they can help you if it's risk management you're after, if it's leverage to your capital that you're after. And, and we talk about some of the experiences that I've had over the years, the conversations with me and Roger about how you use these things, some war stories, you know, things like that to just kind of give you an interesting uh, flavor of, of what it's like to trade options. Sounds great, Imran, and um, fully recommended from uh, my perspective as well. The final thing we need um, to uh, come across today is the meme of the day, uh, Imran. And given all of the discussions on whether we will enter a recession or not, I um, I wanted to show a meme um, having a bit of a laugh around the soft landing narrative. So the breaking news is that soft landing is the new transitory. Let's see whether um, those were my final <laughs> very, very expensive words of the show, Imran. Um, Imran Laka, uh, founder of Options Insight, thank you for joining us at the Real Vision Daily Pleasure. Briefing. Thanks, um, well, Andreas. My name is Andreas Steno. Thank you for watching the Real Vision Daily Briefing out there. My colleague will be back tomorrow with Peter Bukwa guesting the show. See you there. The whole point is to try and make options more accessible, more approachable and more intuitive. Why are you doing these trades? What are you trying to achieve? Like, that's what I've always done from when I first started Options Insight. Made people realize that they're, they're not as risky as they're made out to be. In fact, they kind of help you manage your risk if you understand how to use them correctly. So I'm going to try and lay it out in those layman's terms and, and make it much more understandable than I think the, the average option course out there does.